So hello, everyone. Welcome to the first event in the CELS Winter Speaker Series, uh, Techno Science Beyond the Nation State. I'm Matthew Sample. I'm Professor of Responsible Research and Innovation at Leibniz University, Hanover. Um, I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anna Wynn, who's mm -hmm. at the Faculty of Humanities, who will be moderator for the Q&A later. Um, during the talk, if you want to ask a question, please send it to Anna using the chat function. Um, then during the Q&A, she'll either call on you or synthesize questions with several others. We also have today Joanne from GRT Captioning, um, who will be providing live captions. So you can enable that by hitting the CC button in Zoom um, or by visiting this link I'll put in the chat. So um, a few words about the motivation for this series. So our motivation was that science, technology, knowledge, generally speaking, historically and today are deeply entangled with nationalist projects, aiding in the consolidation of power and providing means for acts of violence. So our hope over the course of the series, we can tackle both meanings implied and beyond the nation state. So that is not only critiquing particular combinations of techno science and nationalism, we'll also try to advance new ways to act and live together across borders with international solidarity. So today we're really lucky to be joined by Karen Luis Hermes. She's a Filipina German story weaver on climate justice, indigenous rights and political philosophies. She writes, thinks and drops seeds of ideas in public media and academic settings, as well as into community spaces. Her dissertation from 2021 was titled Growing Intercommunalist Pockets of Resistance with Aloha Aina in Hawaii is a philosophy of spirit and relationality revealing further seeds of theory to tend in non-linear and spiral space-time. She's lived in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Hawaii, and is currently based in Germany. So thank you so much for being here, Karen. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. And I think I cover most of the bases. We can sort of discuss the techno part. <laughs> that might be the one that is like, not exactly my forte if anyone has listened to me talking about the tech issues that I might be having right now. Um, and I am going to share the screen of my presentation. And I hope yeah, this is good. visible. Okay. So I would just like everyone to know and be prepared that there might be some tech issues. <laughs> <laughs> on my end. Um, and I'm going to treat my presentation or my dissertation a bit like it is a published book, which it technically is in the German context. So I'll also be reading passages from my publication and we'll have those mostly on screen for people to also read at the same time. Uh, and I also gave my talk the very spontaneous subtitle of trickster play ghosts at dreams of other and invisible space times and i wanted to break this up a little bit from a lot of the political theory that i put into my work and there's going to be a longer section of like really a lot of newer free-flowing storytelling that i wrote on my phone app yesterday because of tech issues um, okay, so I wanted to start with this quote that um, I guess sort of just gives everyone a sort of idea of which perspectives I'm coming from and what the contexts are. And this is from my dissertation, and it's from really way in the end in the conclusion. Am I tethered to Hawaiian ways of knowing and being? Perhaps, but this centering acts to guide the privileges I can leverage from the locations I am in with the positionalities that I have. I am also tethered to Philippine spirits and collectivism, New Guinean rivers and estuaries and ghost remnants of two Indonesian languages in my head that I can no longer access. From the various viewpoints that I've been given, I mastered a retranslation or reorientation guided in Kapwa and Hegelian ghost to offer a less place specific form of spiritual attunement in relation or relational attunement in spirit. Through my speculations on the analogies between spirit and light in rainbows or shadows, the imagery of Avakea or the midday sun in Hawaii depicts that tethering as a pico or umbilicus of light to the earth between the skies. 
I did not intend this even as a spiritual or religious imagery as much as it is simply a geo, helio, and egocentric enlightenment orientation and unification of being with the land and environment. So this is from my PhD. And afterwards, I found out that the official term of that would be an axis mundi. <laughs> and this is, I guess, my outline from the talk. I wanted to start a bit on what I just mentioned as Kapwa um, and the sort of form of Filipino beingness, which I guess is very important in and with the diaspora, then I will explain a little bit on the theory of Aloha Aina, which was when my PhD was more specifically about Hawaii, but also about so solidarities. And um, a very important note on tricksters is that when I say tricksters, I really mean trickster spirits and the syncretisms of appropriating colonial matters and metaphysics into cultural beliefs and making them somewhat unrecognizable or into their own thing. These meanings can be both complementary or contradicting to what is expected. My appropriation of Hegelian spirit is a trickster play that allows me to engage with the German philosophy in a way that is not typical to how others engage with him and to also situate Filipino philosophy with analogies in enlightenment and absolute spirit. My point is to really engage with reinscribing thoughts and beliefs in decolonial ways that are not the colonial anticipation. Like when I use Greek pneuma or breath as new materialism to be a pun on the expected new materialism. So to sort of explain Kapwa a bit, it's a virtue ethic for community that is frequently used in diaspora among overseas Filipino workers and in the Philippines itself. Because of how widespread and divergent its use is, I asked around during my PhD to its meaning, and I asked around because I didn't want to rely on the US-centric use of Filipino-American diaspora, but I was also curious to its use by non-Tagalog Filipinos because it's a Tagalog-specific term, or those not interested in a sort of nationalist sentiment of it, like anarchists in the Philippines and in diaspora. So despite its obvious Tagalog centrism, the emphasis of its use in diaspora highlights the connection diaspora has to each other, as well as their, our perception of the archipelago and its people. And when I say archipelago, I usually mean the Filipino one in a sort of non-nationalist term, but I'll be talking about several archipelagos throughout. And with this significance in mind, I propose the term of Kapwa as a useful concept that is particularly detached from the physical space of the archipelago itself and finds more meaning in the shared space of the collective imagination or imagined community of the diaspora. So its meaning shifts from the Tagalog centric and territorial boundaries of the archipelago to a sense of community in and between the diasporas. Some of the valuable scholarship I've been able to access that engages with Filipino ontologies or beingness of this sort of Kapwa collectivism, which I theorize in a separate anarchist theory article, has been in philosophy of virtue ethics or transpersonal psychology. And that's where a lot of the um, American, di well, Filipino American diaspora engages with it in psychology. The emphasis of ethics and the transpersonal highlight the usefulness of building relationality and reciprocity, as well as an appropriate framework to theorize social collectivism going to be very deep theory here right now and then we're going to let go of some of the theory and do more storytelling. <clears throat> so the theory of my PhD um, is framed around Aloha Aina, which is a Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian way of knowing and being and doing. And my PhD can be summarized as an environmental and relational convergence between Hawaiian waters, land, and people for multi-ethnic solidarity place building to places there and elsewhere. So what I did in it was retrace understandings of community, solidarity, and indigenous science through Hawaiian cosmologies and ways of knowing the land. And then from my perspective, also with Filipino ways of being in relation, and because there's a very big Filipino diaspora in Hawaii, that sort of engagement with each other throughout various other Asian ethnicities that are in the islands. What I also really emphasized was recentering the Haudenosaunee kinship spirit to land and more than human community 
as a pre and post Marxist theory for global climate justice with this Hawaiian place based eco philosophy of Aloha Aina, which is often translated as love of the land. And instead of presenting Aloha Aina as like a method of decolonial climate justice to emulate within the global north where I'm located, where my PhD is located, and then remove Aloha Aina, which is very, you know, indigenous and place specific from its actual Aina or land, I theorize the non appropriative and self referential place based construct, which I ended up calling spirit of relationality. So I theorize spirit. <laughs> And um, this theorizing of spirit or vital essence, I did with a lot of metaphors of spaces in between and breath to sort of make a community social theories sort of things by triangulation of the positionalities of me engaging with Hawaiian knowledge from a Filipino and German perspective. And in a way that would you know, be okay to be institutionalized in a German PhD in the end. Um, and that's where some of the word play with Greek pneuma also came in. And I came to the circular and relational analysis because of the shortcomings that I knew about and I saw in community organizing, but also in you know theory spaces of contemporary Marxist understanding of global capitalism and how to confront it. Following Vanessa Watts, who's taught in Oshani and Anishinaabe, and applying the dialectical materialist theorization of the Black Panther Party's Huey P. Newton, I argue that indigenous knowing and being does not carry this binary hyphenation of human environment as a concept of communal, which I really liked in intercommunalism already encompasses the this, this social beings and you know, this engagement community spirit. So for this reason, I chose intercommunalism as both a hyper-local grassroots form of solidarity and a non-state form. So it's not internationalism. And that's the political theory that I use throughout. So it's a lot of anarchist theory too. And relating to Aloha Aina, I felt required a reinserting of a spirit that was removed in Marxist theory. And then also citing its origins, Marxist theory's origins, um, to reconcile Haudenosaunee social structures as Marx and Engels took these on from the anthropology of, of Lewis Henry Morgan, who studied the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. But Marxist theory also could not empirically grasp Haudenosaunee spirit, and this is what Watts criticizes, and removed as well Hegelian spirit, which is what I reinsert in the German context at least, um, because the, these things are deemed too idealist. And this is one of my trickster slides. This is absolutely not the layout I wished it to have. And we're gonna accept this right now. And I, however, prefer engaging with this idealist spirit. So in essence, there was like no describing or engaging with aloha without engaging with spirit. But for me to describe this, I also, <laughs> you know, made wordplay of spirit and light. And then I asked, why should we allow the term of enlightenment and metaphors of light and illumination be the ownership of European philosophy? When sunlight or starlight and feeling a light between or complementary shadows within are surely intrinsic to many beliefs. Trickster play also means that I distinctly select my citations of Hegel to use for decolonial and anarchist collectivism, which may or may not refute his intentions to Prussian statecraft. And the trickster appropriation of Hegel, the German philosopher, in my work can be summarized as what of Hegel's geist, but decolonial anarchist feminist. <clears throat> And that is probably another illustrative thing to how this presentation and all my work and how I, you know, make meaning of things that others would often, you'll see geographically, see as unrelated is really this translation and wordplay and puns and communication and travel. And there was going to be a lot of translation and puns throughout. And in this travel story, there's also going to be swimming and ghosts and dreams. And the domains of these are by the masters of trickster communications, the Greek god who shares my last name, Hermes or Hamas, and what appears to be the Haitian voodoo equivalent in Papa Legba. 
So that's also going to be one of my sort of examples because that was the topic of my PhD. Um, the Fens, the Caribbean, although I usually work with the Pacific. And I wish to show some pictures, but tech did not allow me to. <laughs> And my, my context of like really relating some of these Caribbean and Philippine stories is really on the one hand, in examples from the Philippines or in Haitian voodoo, local knowledge has been relegated to the margins, judged as lacking, labeled as superstitious, irrational, or simply as wrong, when the truth of the matter is histories of anti-colonial resistance. Haitian voodoo is a form of anti-colonial resistance in the, um, in the Haitian Revolution, and it bears similarities with the anti-colonial resistance of the Babaylan, or often feminine um, shamans in the Philippines, and these being called witchcraft. And perhaps it is good that something labeled as heretic and evil has not become so cannibalized as what happened to forms of Hinduism and Buddhism that a lot of, you know, Western lifestyle has um, wanted to engage with. But also the countering of this narrative of being irrational is about as draining as countering cultural appropriations of things like yoga, I would say, and with way less respect afforded. So that's one of the tasks that I really wanted to do is like really engage with these things that are actually philosophy and cultural beliefs and society, social theory, but have been called superstitions. <clears throat> And on the slide that you can see, it's just me giving some context to some of the terms that are going to be in the storytelling and some of the locations, because there's also not going to be any maps um, in this presentation right now. And the stories of my talk will cross several oceans and continents, leaning on what Lenape scholar Joanne Barker has called confluences of water for convergences and solidarity making. And I quote her. Water teaches us to think about knowledge and continuous movement, transition, and change. Water is confluence, transformation, diversion, evaporation, sublimation, condensation, precipitation, storage, runoff, infiltration. Exchange, not qualitative or stagnant systematicity, this equals that. Water is about the movement and form of when and how and with whom we know and not merely what we claim or make claims on. It's analytic value story, humility, care, generosity, and reciprocity. It is life. So a lot of my engagement is really, you know, seeking these perspectives of solidarity and community making from very much Filipino relationality or my own positioning and my own relations with people. And, um, you're going to hear it throughout, but basically most of the examples I give are first or second degree connections of mine. And more meanings that catalyzed spirit philosophies that came to me were through my diving and swimming stories in my PhD, like a phrase of reaching out one's hand or kamai, which is the Tagalog word for hand. In the Tagalog title of Filipino American poet Amy Cesar's poem for Super Typhoon Yolanda, and a second poem by Cesara about amphibious or swimming islanders. So I retold the story of teaching my Filipino friend to swim in Berlin. It's a story about Capua and diaspora relationality, and it's also a story about wrong sources leading to right or valuable meanings. Because the premise of the poem by Amy Cesara relied on her wrong interpretation of an epigraph in the colonial depictions from the 1600s, which actually didn't describe Filipinos, but described the Marianas Islanders, but also in the context where neither of these places were separate at the time or had these names of the nation states or territories that they do now. And in the case of the examples I will describe from contemporary settler colonies like Australia and Hawaii, the specific indigenous terminology and beliefs are more clear to cite in sources. But for trickster purposes of solidarity, I describe those from the lens of my own positionality and relationality to the communities. My last example will more explicitly describe not fully visible or tangible spaces and times of communication through dreams that connect some of the previous cultural examples together to find meaning. 
And while indigenous groups in the Philippines will have their specific names for places and spirits, I gave my perceptions from an urban or diaspora or multiply colonized lens the unspecific term of ghosts. So that's on purpose. It was deliberate that I never use the Hawaiian word for spirits or ghosts, but I do the English, German, or even Greek pneuma wordplay on that. <clears throat> so really to describe all <laughs> in a very short version, um, the trickster play is from metaphors of pneuma as an in-between spirit, and then the Hawaiian word of ea, which means breath, life, or resurgence, or ha, also Hawaiian, which can mean breath. And with wordplay on metaphysics and antagonisms between materialism and matter and idealism. So even with all the auto ethnography that I did in the PhD and like really just to make a point, I was in literature studies for the PhD, but I was doing a lot of community dialogues with people to really check that things I was integrating and interpreting were not just, you know, just my idea. And I wrote a narrative interlude. So throughout the whole body of the thing, I even named something more of an interlude because it's too narrative. Um, <clears throat> that provided the foundations of metaphors and philosophy to spirit and breath without simply declaring Hawaiian beliefs to be my own. And that interlude was on two scuba diving stories in both Kona in Hawaii and in Palawan in the Philippines, which led to my philosophies of spirit on relationality to Hawaiian places, or more specifically, the Pacific Ocean, because that's the waters that are there. And from the manta ray, which is named the hahalua, or two breaths. And the Hawaiian word ea, like the manta ray's doubled ha, provides multiple translations of the English word for breath, including sovereignty, resurgence, and life. And Hawaiian English dictionaries, they also usually describe the hahalua, so the manta ray, as two mouths. So not as two breaths as I was doing it for the feelers of the manta ray with no further imagery of breath resurgence emergence that I was using. So two breaths is my own translation from dictionary entries for ha and ha halua, but they are echoed here by a Hawaiian marine scientist. And I quote her, you can read it too. The name of the manta, ha halua, can be interpreted as two breaths, ha meaning breath and lua meaning two. When mantas leap out of the water, their experience from below transcends into our sphere. Their transcendence speaks to things that we don't know yet. And I link both the Hawaiian words ha and ea in my interpretations, which share this metaphor of breath or spirit or aeration as I needed it in my descriptions, um, in the manta ray or myself emerging from the ocean depths. The theories that I frame from the manta ray philosophy stem from this word play that I could only understand through the Hawaiian word, hahalua, and that I couldn't have connected without these Hawaiian linguistics. Because throughout the Austronesian language region in the Pacific and Asia Pacific, which you know connects the Philippines, Indonesia, and Hawaiian languages, um, only few languages appear to have this linguistic cognate of this two breaths word play. So I couldn't have done that with just the Filipino word. And I am going to occasionally really um, quote some things that I wrote because I wasn't allowed to edit my PhD, even though a lot of other stories came through it. And I will try my best about being explicit where my story currently is in space time travel, but I can't apologize really that this is gonna be non-linear or spiral in narrative, like most of my um, dissertation. And this is how I describe my dissertation as well. After concluding the general framework of chapter five as a foundation, partly written on a ferry in the Aegean Sea with sea spray coating my typing fingers, I found myself writing the general body or limbs, chapters two, three, four, and six of the dissertation at my grandfather's old desk, where I'm right now, um, in the ancestral house I left to go on this journey in the spring of 2015. Had I gone in a circle with half a decade detour to Berlin or was this part of the mapping out of this route? Other planned detours or destinations fell through, including the plans to move to Manila in fall 2019 to continue my writing there. By spring 2020, while most people's plans fell through, the isolation of the COVID-19 pandemic, in fact, sustained this project better than the previous years of subjective stagnancy. The nonlinearity and 
sudden retrograde spiraling to the past in the flow of writing were not initially intended here, but appeared to be the only method that worked to reveal the narrative. And I wanna show some analogies where sometimes I would go back and forth between, is this actually a Hawaiian thing that I'm doing? Is this me following Hawaiian method? And um, it can be described a little bit, and I removed the footnote to this, but I'm also going to read this from my PhD. The best way to describe my nonconformist mode of writing and storytelling is either with churning water and an undertow pulling back, or an unexpected undercurrent pushing the swimmer forward. The story does not begin with a spring that turns into a stream growing to a river that flows into the ocean, but with the open ocean itself. From voyaging the open ocean, chapter five, the first one I wrote, the estuary was reached in chapter six. And from there, the story came onto land, chapter three, and upwards onto the mountain to the skies, chapter four. And in Hawaiian, the mo'o, in the mo'olelo, which means storytelling or history, is not only the sequential narrative, it is also the lizard or reptiles related to the freshwater deities. And this mo'olelo of aloha aina, what my dissertation technically is, a storytelling of Aloha Aina, reflects a nonlinear voyage of fresh water, like a hydrological cycle. Another little anecdote, though, where it's just like, is, is this knowledge that is intrinsic or, you know, embodied in the Philippines, but can't quite be written into theory because it hasn't been legitimized? Um, quoting Katrin Nagia, who happens to be a German a psychologist who studied in the Philippines and lives there. This lifestyle comes with a price tag called unstructured time. A minute more, an hour less, what difference does that make for the now? Filipino time, some say, is experiential time. It is cosmic time, not clock time. It is organic time, cyclical, approximating, wobbling, oscillating, alive. It is a felt time filled with memories, not the repetitive staccato of machine time, nor the sterile flip on off bites of computer time. And right, so so this other thing, and I'm like, I do a lot of analogies about tricksters and ghosts, and I guess that's the tech part that I struggle with sometimes. So another thing about tricksters and citations of them is that they also trick you in observation and engagement. So maybe a lot of contemporary Euro-American scholarship does not engage with tricksters because they do not manifest to reveal themselves. But maybe post-colonial and decolonial scholarship also needs to recognize when it is appropriate to reveal and not conceal the tricksters within. Is there a ghost that is manifested to be seen by the colonizer or is the ghost only a communication to the colonized? If it is not meant to manifest or be seen for the colonizer, then perhaps this entails the reason and rationalizing of the so-called irrational minds who see something the other perspective does not. At the same time, naming an empirical observation gives power to those who name it. And if the ghost is named as such, it allows the rationalization of the experience of more than the rationali uh, rationalization of something that cannot be explained. So you name it and it actually makes, gives it meaning, makes more sense. And this is really what um, happened in my writing process. So one of the ghosts that I made meaning of in my writing was the establishment of my chapter topics and sequences, as I described as land, sky, ocean, and then the estuary that brought these spaces together appeared. Four or five years after I'd placed subtopics to that chapter without knowing why. So <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of my structure in the PhD was the same as it had been for five years, and I didn't quite know why until it sort of manifested for me to say, this is the estuary space, this is what chapter six is. And in the formation of this estuary chapter space, my conclusion often came back to the relations made, which I interwove in narration above, meaning this is my conclusion. Um, However, new of the PhD, however, numerous of them were related to the striking moment of convergence where I first integrated the indigenous and climate action that came out of it. Paradoxically, I can name the situation of meeting global actors in front of the US consulate in Berlin Dahlem in the pouring rain to fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline as a place of convergence for non indigenous solidarity for indigenous resurgence and climate justice. So a lot of my work also comes from community organizing and this one event in particular. 
and also from my own writing, many other places of convergence that do not seem as ironic as a US federal institution would be located otherwise in virtual space online, but also at the Brandenburg Gate during protests with or without my own speeches that I gave in Berlin. And to um, <clears throat> describe a bit about this just briefly because it's gonna make sense of my more fluid storytelling too. Um, this was a space at the US consulate of meeting my Chirikahua Apache and Cherokee friend Red Hair Crow, who coordinated the direct action, and Gumbangir Roxley Foley, who brought an indigenous Australian flag to hang from a tree across the consulate. Roxley Foley's father, Black Australian liberation elder Gary Foley, was inspired by the same intercommunalism of the Black Panther Party that frames my PhD theory. So it's like a second generation solidarity. And this is also from my writing. Because of the rain, there was no space for lighting a fire, as he was the firekeeper of the Aboriginal tent embassy at the time. Roxley was in Europe as a representative with Rodney Kelly, a descendant of the Guiagal warrior Kuman, who had dropped the Guiagal shield in a standoff with James Cook for its repatriation from the British Museum. Coincidentally, when visiting Berlin and seeking Aboriginal artifacts in the archives of the Berlin Dahlem Museum collections, an until then forgotten twin shield to the Guayagal shield, taken from the contact with James Cook in Botany Bay in indigenous resistance 246 years before was found in the German Museum archives. And I relay this story not just because it tells the story of how I met Roxley, but also how this meeting at the US consulate protesting the oil pipeline at Standing Rock came together with Berliners. <clears throat> show a bit more of like how much meaning this estuary had in spirit and in solidarity. Apparently the area around Botany Bay, so that's Sydney, I'm going to give it its colonial name, um, was initially named Stingrays Harbor by Cook and journal keepers for the number of stingrays they caught there, but then renamed for the abundance of botany or plants collated. The Guiagal name of the bay, however, is Kamai, as the Tagalog word for hand is. This has no linguistic relation whatsoever outside of my own plurilingual interpretations to space time and place thought of the Muliwai or estuary, yet I will convey them here. With the convergence of metaphors in this naming of manta, stingrays, and my ea reference in the previous chapter five on the ocean, as well as in the laulima of maybe there is something we build across the seas of Suzara's Kamai poem, the Guergal encounter and shield resistance or resurgence and Kanakamali resistance or insurgence to the murder of Captain Cook in Kiala Kakua Bay are standing in indigenous kinship from one estuary to another. Standing in the intercommunal present because the actions of ancestors and the places of Kamai and Kiala Kakua exist in the present day in perpetuation of ancestral thought and being. To that effect, this present also opens paths to the future as both places are connected in the settler colonial structures of what is currently Australia and the USA, both born of the British Empire, which houses the Guergal Shield in its museum in London. And um, if there's anything that I, of context, you can ask me because I hope that this example um, made sense from the Sydney context of what Kamai means. And I'm gonna more fluidly read um, other related contexts of the, I guess the spirit relationality to that term. And this is where <laughs> tech really did not want me to, to make a nice slide. Um, and I am going to sort of read a little bit of more fluid storytelling. So <clears throat> what I separated in the outline is two stories on Haitian voodoo and the Andean space, time and energy, that's also called Kamai can't be sequentially detached after all, and I weave them together as both happening after, but also from within the PhD dissertation and before the PhD defense. This is about a dream that I had in mid-September last year. So after I had written and submitted the PhD, but long before the formal process of PhD delays was officially over in defense or certification, I was in like a 53 week, like more than a year liminal space. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, more in the uh, discussion. And in the PhD, I had wondered about this Kamei in Australia and its name in Sydney. 
if there could be more relation and metaphors in the possible Gadigal word to the PhD story about the Gwergolf shield, in particular about the red mangrove of the Gwergolf shield, because that helps, um, or that's a dispute with archeologies span and the British Museum if the shield is really the same one that was at the encounter with Captain Cook, because the red mangrove is not located in the bay of Kame, Botany Bay but from several miles further upward. And because I couldn't edit my old dissertation from summer the summer before, um, that's why I read to you the quotes that I published on the topics of Kamei, because this part of the story is really things that came out um, since. And in the end, after dream analysis and scouring meanings online and in conversations across continents with some people who I think are in, in this discussion, um, I landed on the meaning of vital energy in ancient and contemporary Andean philosophy. The information came in a Spanish language article about potatoes and agriculture, which also mentioned other PhD overlaps about liminal spaces of spirits like rainbows and caves and waters, but the article was in Spanish. I can give more clarifications on the dream and discussion, but there are aspects that don't need to be in this recording, like they aren't explicit in a public blog where I've also explained these um, connections in. From separate recurrent dreams, I was also pondering about the symbolism of the manta ray and in relation to the Southern Cross constellation, which also um, features in my PhD, but is not technically a symbol um, in Hawaii or in the Philippines because they're further to the north of the equator. I was working on postdoc applications at the time and had spent the week and evenings poring over Spanish and other sources and maps about how the Manila galleon trade didn't end in Acapulco, but continued to the port of Calao at Lima in the vice royalty of Peru. I was also looking into information about galleon maroons who would settle in Acapulco or Lima and only be tracked as Indio Chino among other varying labels on ship logs, like referring to the men from Manila or Manila men before they were called Filipinos. One particular feature of the dream that night concerned an infant, which I seem to call Ambon, and also bird in English, in my dream. And the next day I tried figuring this riddle out when I realized that Ambon was not in fact the Indonesian word for bird, as I had thought in my dream, Instead, I had several Filipino or Indonesian speaking friends online informing me to my inquiries that Ambon meant dew or drizzle or light rain in Tagalog, like the word Embun in Indonesian, and obviously was the name of the island in the Moluccas, which is central to colonialism, the Spice Islands. Checking maps of Ambon, I saw that the Bird's Head Peninsula um, in the geography of West Papua, and Indonesia was also right there. The city of Manokwari was also there, with Manok being the Tagalog word for chicken, a bird. Well, it doesn't mean chicken in Indonesia. What did Wari refer to, I wondered, and sifted through more online language references. I skipped right over the fact that I actually knew that the word Wari spelled that way meant to worry in Papua New Guinea and talk pisin. There's some other results that I found um, in indigenous language of this territory around Bird's Head Peninsula in West Papua. And like with the chicken or the worrying, none of these words felt intuitively right. Like the information or drizzle or dew had actually felt right for me in the word ambon. I also checked if there were manta rays in these waters and estuaries near the coastlines. I felt an intuitive hit when I came across Wari as the name of a pre-Inca civilization, what is now Peru, which I had never heard of before. This fit the location of Lima Calao, and were manta rays relevant to this region too? Which bird would it be then? I searched and saw how diverse the bird life is in Peru. There is a lot of birds in Peru until I knew or saw instinctively that the very Andean symbol of the condor was what I needed and how the condor wingspan and gliding in the sky could mirror the manta ray wingspan and gliding in the depths. The potato article I found that had the keyword kamai in its Spanish text had me skimming the full Spanish context with certain passages being more easily comprehended thanks to how they were telling me things that my PhD had written about in English. The vital energy of Kamai, the rainbows like drizzles and dew of light and water suspended in air, the liminal here and now space time of Kaipacha were all more intuitive hits for me reading them in Spanish than a chicken had been in the Filipino context. The condor and the Andean wari were more intuitive to me than anything I had sought in maritime Southeast Asian waters. 
And earlier this week, for the first time, I learned of Filipino and Austronesian sources having a similar tripartite cosmology, one that I hadn't been familiar with in Hawaiian sources, a similar cosmology as in the Andes of uh, upper and inner and liminal world of the here and now. And this spiral form of space-time and shell imagery that I had formulated in my PhD wasn't explicitly a feature in Hawaiian sources I had come across, then it was the central feature of Andean Pacha space-time. The liminality of Kaipacha meant that the upper world and inner world or the future and the past weren't linearly separate or sequential from the here and now. Ancestors and descendants and obviously ghosts or trickster spirits could exist parallel against temporality or visibility in Pacha. The manta rays migrated like sardines did with the Humboldt current and the El Nino and La Nina patterns along the Peruvian coast. Condors were also impacted by the climate systems here, where the El Nino received its name from coastal fisher folk according to the Christ child and abundance of fish. The Kamai that I had sought to understand in the estuary of Kamai Botany Bay, and I'd actually inquired with a museum linguist in Sydney <laughs> for that in my PhD, um, was giving me more symbolic answers in Kalau and the north coast of Peru and the Andean Valleys and the Cordilleras. The Southern Cross constellation is also central to Andean beliefs in the symbol of the Chicana or the three-tiered steps and cross of Pacha space-time. I was describing the my search, searches and overlaps and symbolisms to Anna here <laughs> a few weeks ago, and I was thinking then about another revelation that I got. Because when I was describing it to her, I, I remembered how I had to butcher the pronunciation of Khmer in my PhD defense to be more comprehensible for those knowing the Khmer Rouge as the Khmer Rouge instead of the Khmer Rouge. I remembered in my explanation to Anna how that more co correct pronunciation would really be the same sort of word and essence of Khmer. So what does any of the why does any of the Andean features with so much symbolism of what I recognize as being correct or intuitive feelings of relational meaning? The entire PhD about Hawaiian and Filipino and other convergences and solidarities was always catalyzed in 2015 through a Peruvian relation. The writing and conclusion of the PhD in 2020 and 2021, after what seemed to be years of stagnant time or of building relations in Berlin and to the Philippines more explicitly, overlapped with cutting contact to that Peruvian relation who lived in Hawaii for over four years, and I was just not getting ahead. Throughout the writing and surviving through meaning making, especially about rivers, ghosts, mirrors, shadows, light, and spirits in general, I was thinking about and with Peruvian spirits. My PhD afterward reflected on not always knowing the citations of flowing philosophical narratives in the writing, and it ends on the specific river ghosting source that left me to interrogate these things on my own, or with other mirroring Peruvian relations like Caleb here <laughs> to understand. And again, really with this emphasis, I wasn't allowed to edit my PhD since July 2021 and had over a year to ponder over all these things that I was then finding out. And I only defended it in February 2022 on the topic of the Caribbean and Cambodia, a topic I chose based on the same music that had led to the pneuma and shadow and breath symbolism and that band is tool. <laughs> a topic that I didn't know was related to the most recent department PhD who had since died, Dominican writer and decolonial theorist Alana Lockwood. Several networks of relation were interlinked with Lockwood and my support system to the PhD and I cited her work in my defense. The symbolisms of vapors and vortexes, which I did get to edit and add into my acknowledgments of the PhD, were what I chose to highlight. And I also chose to highlight the complementary dualities in Haitian voodoo in the Marasa, where one plus one is three, which sort of also emulates this, this absolute spirit engagement in you know, Euro uh, philosophy of, of, in Christianity, the Trinity. And I didn't know Lockwood when she was alive, but a lot of her work and intellectual relations wove together in the sources that helped my PhD defense. I could name so many invisible sources related to Haitian voodoo and Andean Pacha that don't count as valid or scholarly in my work, but need to be named in relationality and spirits. The more visible and more legitimate sources could be named in the Haitian compa music I was listening to throughout the PhD liminal space time. 
And the less visible and less rational it could be named and how without knowing Lockwood when she was alive, she was a reason I had in believing I was in the right place for my PhD project in 2015. Other invisible sources that led to a very needed argument in my defense presentation connect to the Andean Pacha and the Haitian voodoo with each other, where my Peruvian friend Caleb had explained a limpia or cleansing meditation to me, from which I grasped three terms in this meditation to argue the following synthesis of the words bat, cave, and Haiti. The bat caves on the island that are paid respect to in Haitian voodoo are the same caves seen as the origin of the Taino in their creation cosmology. With that argument I had synthesized from across sources of searching the three terms, I could argue against Taino extinction narratives in the Caribbean and argue for the respect and perpetuation in syncretic beliefs without forwarding any sort of form of indigenous revivalism or authenticity claims or anti-Black claims in some indigenous revival movements. And arguing on the basis of Taino revivalism removed from race and colonial differences between the island's nations and these you know, divergent colonial systems across their archipelagos would discount histories of Caribbean resistance. Most significantly, it would erase the narratives of cultural heritage and dynamics of the Haitian revolution and liberation from enslavement of indigenous peoples from the African continent. The argument also underlined the histories that reached across the islands and across the diverse African belief systems that brought old spirits to new lands. Since my main topic was expected to only focus on Puerto Rico and Spanish Florida, I focused on what Edouard Glisson instead termed the estuary of the Americas in his Poetics of Relations. So it was really this water that connects. I guess I'll wrap up now too with this last slide. So really just to bring these together in things that were having this shared symbolism across languages, across cultures, but always finding some sort of meaning that somehow related to each other. And also especially this, this imagery of the estuary um, and some of the political theory I did in my um, work. I'm gonna just read this last quote from my PhD. So over a year ago, um, about that convergence at the US consulate in Berlin. This was a coming together from virtual space to an interspatial convergence for action. With the online hashtag no dapple in relation to other indigenous movements, Mauna Kea in my case, in the um, <clears throat> social movements in Hawaii. This Berlin location was a transient space time which built engagement and intercommunalist actions from there on. We exchanged stories of coloniality to cultivate resistance through intercommunal care between Standing Rock, Mauna Kea, and in Roxy Foley's case, the Griegal Shield repatriation. The convergence was so brief in the actual place of the clay alley, but in relation to a decolonial ghost mapping of virtual space, it would always be possible to locate an image of this event in Google Maps. Intriguingly instead, since none of us actually took any photos and linked them, um, <laughs> Google Maps now depicts a five-fingered artificial lake in this location. This lake, as artificial and new as it may be, stands in this alternate imagery of working together, or laulima, of five fingers on a hand, or a group of people working together in collaboration. So that's the metaphor of some of my other examples of the Protecta Ho'olave Ohana in the 1970s, or themes that I interpreted in the Estrian Fish Fund and Growth for Abundance poetry. And I guess, that is my conclusion and anything else we can cover in any questions that come up.